Hey guys, Nigel here again, uh, Nigel's Land Rover channel and today we've now got part 4A of the um, diff build for you and this is where we're actually going to put the bearings into the uh, main um, transfer case, the main housing, we're going to fit the rear housing on which then presses that bearing in and then we're going to fit the other bearing, the front bearing, into the front housing with shims and we're going to shim it all up just like we did with the, um, with the input shaft. I made a tool as I said I was going to, so I've turned up a, a piece of aluminium, it's got steps on it, the first step is to locate inside the bearing track and then the next step is precisely one millimetre and then I looked at this housing and I thought that's more than a millimetre and from, from this face to this face which is basically where it's going to push the bearing in is about 1.7 so I make this precisely one millimetre as per the manual. You don't need to worry about it. If it's anywhere up to like 1.5 it's going to be absolutely fine. So um, yeah, it's bloody stupid. So uh, I made that tool anyway. So now I can press that bearing in without having to hit anything. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is add a bit of heat. Well, not add a bit of heat, just make some heat. Just warm this casing up slightly, just a touch. Just because it's cold and the casing will be quite small. Enough, just a bit of water, just so you can see it's not even hot. I can hold my hand on there. But we do get a drop of condensation because it's cold, so I'm just going to dry it off. Notice I'm using paper towel. Paper towel is not suitable for, for cleaning off parts with edges and stuff. It's only any good for doing flat surfaces like that. So I'm off of the bearing up into the hole, into the bore, should I say. That to sit nice and square. And then I can put this plate on the top and if you don't have a press what you could do now is just tap it in but what I'm going to do I'm going to go over to the press and just press it in you've seen me press loads of bearings I don't need to show you this okay so we can see now that that's the plate I used and you can see now the diameter's on there and that's pressed that bearing in so it's a millimeter under the face so that's basically that bearing in place now what we need to do is make sure this bearing is um, seated if your output shaft is still built up and everything, if all you're doing is fitting an ATB and you've still got the bearing, the seal and the flange and everything all still on here, um, what you could do at this stage is just put some silicon sealant on here, some of your um, Hilo Sil, put some of your sealant on there now and fit it permanently. It doesn't need to come off again. Now, because I haven't got the bearing in there and I haven't got the seal and I don't have the shaft and everything, I'm just dry fitting this to literally set the, um, set the shims up, as you know. I'm going to be dry fitting this and then taking it off again. So what I'm going to do is locate it. You can see that that spigot diameter locates in there and we can see that this face isn't down. Okay, it's like I say, it's about 1.7. So we've got one 45 mil bolt, let's get this bag out of the way. And then we've got five 30 millimeter bolts. Okay, so the 30 millimeter bolts obviously go in here and then the 145 goes in the longer hole. It's all quite obvious. Now the manual talks about having different types of bolts and nuts and washers and God knows what, but this is um, this is all sort of made very simple for us on the um, on the TDCI. Maybe the TD5 is the same. I don't know. You can tell me in the comments. But it does seem that a lot of the stuff on the Puma is a read across from the TD from the TD5. So it could well be the TD5 transfer box is exactly the same as this one. It wouldn't surprise me. Now that I've learned that they did away with the crush washer on the TD5, or the crush sleeve, should I say. So get these bolts wound in. And the reason I've got the camera on is because obviously now we need to be mindful of how we do these bolts up because we're pulling that bearing in more. So 
that one's gone up. I have actually cleaned all these threads out. That one's gone just a tad tight. I'm not going to worry about it because I can still screw it in my fingers. If I couldn't, I would stop and see what's going on. But um, these were absolutely drenched in thread lock, thread seal, whatever you want to call it. So I did actually run a tap through the holes to clean them out. Okay, so I've got a torque wrench here set to 25 newton meters. What I'm going to do is what I can get the socket on is pull these down diagonally. Now I'm just going to go like a little bit at a time because what it's going to do is pull the bearing in as we go. I'm just literally going like a, a quarter a turn at a time with that. It feels like that one's down now. Yeah, that's down now by the feel of it. Okay, so I'm going to tighten these up. Again, diagonally. and check. Oh, I can't hold the casing. Sorry guys, I'm going to put this off across the camera. Here we go. There we go. So they're all down. So that's that bearing now pressed in fully. Turn the casing over. We can look down inside there and we can see. Can you see? There you go. You can see the bearings in there now. So, uh, what we need to do now is start looking at the front casing. Right, so here's the front output housing. I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Um, if you need to, well, you're going to need to knock this bearing out unless you're very lucky and your, your shims are correct. It's best to strip this housing down because I don't know if you can see in there. I tried to knock this bearing out without taking the, sh the end of the output shaft bearing out. And the trouble is you drift, you're, you're drifting it out on such an angle like this, that it's very difficult not to touch the sides. And I have slightly damaged the sides. I've sanded it out. It's, it's going to be absolutely fine, but it's difficult not to damage it. So my suggestion is take this bearing out and the um, seal. You know, I mean, you might want to replace them anyway because they do go and they're extremely cheap to replace. Um, you know, you may as well while you've got it apart. So basically this bearing is, is here, obviously, and we've got a shim under the bearing. Now, this is the shim that was in my original transfer box. <clears throat> I did mic it up and I've forgotten what it is, but it is... It is three... Sorry, 2.65. Okay, so it's 2.66 millimetres. I'm just going to double check. Yeah, 2.66 millimetres. So I'm going to put this one in because this is basically what was in there. Sorry, guys. So, yeah, that's basically what was in there before. So I'm going to put this one in again um, and then basically nip the bolts up and we'll see what we've got. So that's going to sit in there like that and the bearing is going to go in on top now once again as before I'm going to add a little bit of warmth and then I'm going to press the bearing in and yes you guessed it I've just turned up a little tool like a piece of scrap nylon I had lying around and that fits on there so we can press that in lovely and not have any issues so I'll get on and get that done and then I'll come back and we'll try putting it all together okay that bearings in now as you can see in there and we've got this shim in there behind it, the original one. So what I'll do now is I'll clean up this face. I'll put the diff in the actual main transfer case and drop this on top. And what we'll do is we'll finger tighten the bolts and see if we've got any end float. If we have, go on and tighten the bolts. If we haven't, I'll put some shim in there, some 10 thou shim. And if we've got 8 thou of end float, then I know it's perfect because when I take the 10 thou out, I'll have 2 thou preload. So um, I very much doubt that's going to happen, but let's wait and see. Let's see what happens. 
Right, so we can drop this um, front housing on now, make sure it ends up in the right place. Um, so we've got the, we've got a dowel hole here, and that's going to go onto that dowel there. By the way, the manual tells you this dowel should be like that, but this one's actually 90 degrees to what it should be. I'm not going to attempt to take it out or turn it because it'll probably snap, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. So that's going to go over the dowel hole and then it's going to drop on like so. There we go into the casing. I'm not hitting the mallet or anything, just using hand pressure. In fact, I will just get a plastic mallet and just give it a little tap here. Just to make sure it goes down. There we go. It's down now and I can feel that this. Can't feel any backlash on the diff. So what I'm going to do is the first thing I'm going to do is put some shim under there. There we go. I've got the casing on now, and these bolts are all just nipped up. I haven't torqued them because obviously with the shim in there, it'll just twist the casing. So I've got the clock. There's an M8 thread in here, so I've got the clock bolted in there, matted over the top, and the end of the clock is touching the is touching the shaft. And as you can see, it's zeroed. So if I just come up and zoom you in you should be able to see the clock. Oh no, you can't. <laughs> I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll increase the pressure to bring the needle up higher so you can see it. How's that? There you go. So I've got my uh, crowbar again. I'm going to go in here underneath the gear and lift, lift the shaft. And Oh, look at that. Six thou of preload, sorry, six thou of movement. So that means if I bolt this together with that shim in, I'll have four thou of preload with the silicon and everything. It's going to be slightly less. So I'm kind of tempted. Yeah, that's like seven thou. So I'm kind of tempted to leave it at that. So there we go guys. Yeah. So what I should be able to do now is bolt that up now and it should feel lovely. So let's have a look. Okay, so I took all the, the shim out and bolted it all up and talked everything down. And I didn't really like the feel of it too much. It felt a little bit too tight. I think it had about five thousand, four and a half, five thousand preload. Just didn't like it. These are bigger bearings. So what I've done, I took the shim out, the spacer, and I've used the Ashcroft shim kit and I've reduced the preload by about two thousand. So now we can see I've got the clock there zeroed. It's just off zero actually. Here we go, that's zero. And then I can move move the shaft up and you can see now we've got like 7,000. So that's that's going to be about three pound throw of preload when it's all clamped down. So what I'm going to do is um, take the ship out, bolt it up again, see how it feels. And there we go, as you can hear, that's a little bit noisy because the bearings are dry, but um, but yeah, it's lovely. Spinning nice and freely with a little bit of drag, which is what you want. So I'm um, really happy with that. So that's it, that's the diff done. So that's all the bearing shimmed up now in the diff. That's all the bearing shimmed up on the input shaft. Tomorrow, tomorrow being Monday, I will be getting the new bearings and stuff from, um, from Ashcroft for the intermediate shaft. And then we can go from there. So uh, you can set that up. And then once that's set up, that'll be part five. And then once that's set up, part six is going to be the final actual build where we actually build it with sealer and thread lock and all that sort of good stuff. So uh, thanks for watching this one. Oh, one thing I did want to say, um, something I did notice when I got my old diff out, because I'm going to package it up and advertise it, sell it. Um, I noticed there was a load of thread lock around the splines for the actual high-low um, selector hub. So I actually took this apart again. Remember I said I didn't stick that nut? I knew there was a reason for it. Um, I took all this apart again and then I actually put some um, 638, some um, retainer on there. And actually, so that is bonded on there now, basically. It did have quite a bit of play in it. So maybe 
you know, if they reach a certain tolerance on the splines, they put thread lock on them or something, or maybe they just thread lock them anyway, like they will not thread lock them, bearing fit them, um, like they do with the output flanges. So, um, so I thought I better do the same, and that at least then I know it's all on there, solid and everything, the same as it was on the on the factory diff. And then the next guy will just have to heat it up to press it off. So um, that's what, that's something else I did off camera last night afterwards. So um, anyway, thanks for watching this. I'll see you all for part five, and as I say, that'll be um, that'll be doing the intermediate bit. Bye for now.